If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 254 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be another classic episode for the ages. My guest today is legendary TV writer, Emmy Award winner, executive producer, Chris Kluse. Loved his work on Mad TV, SCTV, Cheers, Night Court. So many amazing stories coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, I just wanted to remind you, if you haven't got your groove on, if you didn't go all Brady-rific, Susan Olson, Cindy Brady, my interview on episode 252 awaits you. We dive deep into the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, one of the craziest shows ever to be on TV. And we dive deep. And we're diving deep today. Chris Kloos, amazing writer, executive producer, and amazing storyteller. Tons of stories right now. Enjoy. All right, everyone, I'm excited to introduce you to my next guest, producer, writer, Emmy Award winner. You've loved his work in Mad TV, SCTV, Cheers, Simpson, Night Court, so many classics. We'll see what we can get to in this time. Welcome to the show, Chris Kloos. Hey, good day, good day. Hello. 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 Chris, your uh, your writing and producing career, it's like it's like the greatest hits of everything I've loved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've done a couple of these recently, and that's what everybody said so it makes me happy i don't even know where to start the uh, should we start with the tortellis i don't know <laughs> oh yeah. yeah that was the worst experience so thank you well, let's get that out of the way my dog is barking in the distance yeah let's get the tortellis out of the way it was the worst okay so that's it over <laughs> That was a spinoff of Cheers, Cheers. which yeah. uh, I assume, I hope, was a, a better experience. But what happened was we had gotten a, what they used to call, and I think they still have them, but cause something called an overall deal at a studio. So you'd make a deal and uh, you were exclusive to the studio and they would set you up in offices and pay you fairly handsomely for doing basically nothing. It was compelling uh, high-end uh, welfare and it really was great, and I was so sorry to see it go. But we had that deal at Paramount, we being my partner, Stu Kreisman, and myself. And we had the deal at Paramount, and part of the deal was we could be asked to consult on current programs. So we met with uh, Glenn and Les Charles and Jim Burroughs, who were the brains behind uh, Cheers, also behind the Tortellis, and asked us to join the show because they needed a little bit of help, is what we were told. So we went there. As I said, it was a nightmare. And so we did the inverted route to Cheers. Instead of going from, from civilian life to Cheers, we went from civilian life to the Tortellis, then begged the Charles brothers to fire us from the show because we couldn't get out. And they uh, instead uh, brought us over to Cheers for the rest of the season. So that's that's how we got there. So you were with Cheers. So you wrote one episode, but we you were, were with uh, Cheers. We were consultants on that show. Yeah, we would come to pitch meetings and writer writer meetings, and um, that was it. Yeah, it was so wonderful. I mean, they had such wonderful people there, and uh, and the show itself, as you, as you know, was just one of the classics of uh, American television history. Some people think it's the best sitcom that ever existed, and they could be right. Yeah, and in season five, it's because this yeah. is Shelley Long still yeah. there. Well, Shelley is a, an old friend of mine. Our kids went to preschool together. That was after we did the, the time on Cheers. And part of the reason that, not the reason so much, but part of the MO behind the episode that we wrote for the show was they wanted to test out um, how the show would play without her because she was planning on, or threatening anyway, to leave the show after, the, after that season and her contract was up. 
they began to really take her seriously. So they, we pitched a sh uh, an idea to them, and they uh, bought it, and we wrote it, and she read it, and she said, where am I? And that forced the entire thing to be rewritten. So uh, what was going to be a test case on the uh, Shelley Lest's Cheers turned out to be Shelley was in it, so we never found out till she left. I was gonna say I watched the episode; she was definitely in it. So it was a, an original attempt to backdoor, kind of see how how the show would do. Yeah, yeah, which which just didn't it didn't happen because she, I think she got got a great strong sense of it. She was in the opening scene and then she was gone, and next thing you know, she's back in. Is that why it's called The Godfather Part Three? Called The Godfather Part Three because the character of Joy, yeah, her name was Joyce, which is also, oddly enough, my wife's name. And the coach who had passed away uh, was her godfather. No, I'm wrong. Sam was her god. Sam was a god. Oh, okay, got it. Sam was a godfather. Right, Joyce was coach's niece. Yes, that's right. Joyce was coach's niece. So she came... And as you know, gets hooked up with Woody, and uh, it was a real. I thought it was a really funny episode. It was a really funny episode. You know, Woody Harrelson. Now you walk, you, you watch the old Cheers. You're like, he was really, really, really funny. He was really funny, and Woody is a very underrated guy. He's a, I think he's a great actor. He sure was great on that show, no question about it. He was completely different than Nick, who played Coach. He was that wonderful kind of naivete that that just plays, you know, because he looked it, he said it, and he, you know, just everyone fell in love with Woody. It was one of those cases where the character gets replaced, or, yeah. I mean, Coach died, so it wasn't, but like, it comes in as its own thing. Yeah. It wasn't. It really, yeah, it really opened, opened the show for a lot of stories. Were you there during the transition then to Kirstie Alley? No, that, was, that came the following season, and we were, we were doing pilots uh, at Paramount at that time. Your start, though... Back in yeah. New York, was it the National Lampoon as a yeah. contributing editor? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. And uh, still something I'm very proud of and very pleased to have been a part of. So we arrived at what I call the golden era had just kind of passed when Michael O'Donohue and Ann Beats and some of the other writers from the magazine left for Saturday Night Live. Uh, we arrived afterwards so what i i call the silver era not quite as exciting as the gold but still pretty good we had sean kelly and tony hendra and pj o'rourke and ellis weiner and jeff greenfield and john hughes and so it, was, it went bad yeah that sounds like a, a nice lineup it was a very good lineup i have a great story about we how we got there if you'd like to hear it oh yeah i like to focus in on all the great stories so please yeah it's a pretty good one Stu and I were trying to be writers together, a writing team, and uh, we had um, spent, I don't know, maybe a couple of years. We both worked at CBS in New York, and we had these kind of administrative jobs, and we would write in the evening together or on Saturdays or whenever, or sometimes at work, whenever we could get the time to do it. So we had compiled a, a rather thick book of sketches that we had no idea what to do with. You know, we were writing spec sitcoms. We wrote a spec sitcom for, we wrote a spec Barney Miller and managed to misspell 85% of the character's name. So that was not one of our high moments, but we had this thing in the bag and we had it and we wrote all these sketches. And then along comes uh, Saturday Night Live, or as it was known then, the first week NBC Saturday Night. So on Sunday morning, I called him at his house and I said, did you see that thing on NBC last night at 1130? And he said, I, yeah, it was just amazing. I mean, that's really what we should take our great sketches down there and they could hire us. And I said, yeah, that's it. That sounds like a good idea. So that Monday on our uh, lunch break, we scurried over from CBS to NBC to Rockefeller Plaza, Rockefeller Center, and uh, 30 Rock, and went into the lobby and walked up to the desk where the, these two guards sat, one doing the crossword puzzle, not looking at us at all, and the other guy kind of bored looking. 
we walk up and uh, we say, uh, excuse me, can you tell us where Saturday night is? Well, that sounded like a theophysical question to this guy, I think. And uh, the other guy, it, it, we did not respond. And the first guy seemed confused by the question. And finally, the second guy who never looked up from his crossword puzzle said, third floor. And this guy, the other guy, had no idea what we were talking. So we left behind this confused security guard, went to the third floor, watched furniture being moved around by Chevy Chase and Al Franken and all these guys uh, that we would come to know later, although we knew Chevy, but uh, that we would come to know later. We walked up to this woman whose name was Kathy Minkowski. I will never forget her as long as I live. And she was Lauren Michaels' assistant. Yeah, I remember because she had a little name tag that said that. We said, hi, uh, we are the, we're guys from uh, who sh you should be reading our sketches because we've written these sketches over the last year or two, and they're really great, and we think you should hire us. And she said, you seem charming and nice and everything, but you, ha you need to leave because I can't accept any unsolicited material. So said, how do we get it solicited? And she said, through your agent. And I thought, well, we're dead. We don't, we don't have an agent. And she said, well, that's, that's a problem. You need to go get an agent and then have them submit your material. So we said, well, look, you said we're, char we're nice, we're charming. Uh, I'm telling you, we're really funny. And uh, you should read this. And she said, I'm telling you that if you leave this with me, I'm going to have to put it in the trash. So we looked at each other and we kind of challenged that and said, well, you know, we'll take that chance. We're going to leave this with you gonna, and we, I'm, we're going to bet you're not going to put it in the trash, but you're going to reopen it up and read it. You're going to laugh and then you're going to go, I got to give this to my boss and he was going to read it and then we're going to get uh, jobs here. And she said, that's not going to happen. So don't leave it. So we left it and we went to the elevator convinced and once the elevator door opened, we walked in convinced that we would never see that again, and they were never going to call us, and we had just really screwed this whole thing up. So we went back to our jobs at CBS for the rest of the afternoon. Stu had a car. Uh, he was going to drop me off at the subway station on 7th Avenue, and he was going home to Long Island. And when we got to the corner of 57th Street and 7th Avenue, right up from Carnegie Hall, He's talking about his career in the sports world as a sportscaster, and I'm looking past him, and a door opens up, and out of that door walks Danny Aykroyd, John Belushi, and Garrett Morris. This was kismet. This was meant to happen. They walked directly in front of Stu's car and into a waiting taxi cab in front of us, and for the first time in my life, I actually uttered the phrase, follow that cab. And he followed the cab all the way down to the Atlas statue of, on uh, Fifth Avenue across, across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral in front of 30 Rock. The cab pulled up and he pulled a car up behind him and he said, if you're ever going to make an impression on anybody, do it now. So I got out of the car completely nervous. I stepped towards the guys as they began to get out of the cab. There were probably a thousand people on that street because it was just around Thanksgiving time. People were shopping and looking and doing. I walked up to them and at the top of my lungs, I said, stop, I'm not going to hurt you. Well, what they heard in New York in 1975 was, stop, I'm going to hurt you. So uh, Garrett Morris ran away, Belushi covered up, and Aykroyd took a fighter's stance. He was going to fight me right there on Fifth Avenue. And I said, oh, hold on, hold on, no fighting. Here's what happened. Told him the story about Kathy Minkowski and leaving the stuff and going brokenhearted home and, I mean, to back to work and now going home and then running into them because we believed it was kismet. Well, Belushi just looked at me like I was the biggest asshole he had ever seen, and believe me, he'd seen some big assholes. And Aykroyd just kind of scratched his head. He said, you know, this sounds real somehow. So he gave me a card out of his pocket and a pen. He said, write your phone number down on this. So I did. I wrote my phone number down, and then he left, and they both went into the building. And as they were leaving, Belushi looked at me and said, you are an asshole. And I said, oh, thank you so much. And then he left, and Stu had to go around the block about four times because the cops wouldn't let him stop. So he stops. He picks me up. He says, what happened? I said, I, I tell him what happened. I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but boy, that was weird. 
That night at 11.30 on that Wednesday night, my phone, uh, Monday night, my phone rings and it's Danny Aykroyd. And he found the uh, sketchbook in the trash. So he pulled it out of the trash, took it to his office, leafed through it and called me. And he said, listen, some of this is okay. A lot of this is crap. I said, well, you know, thanks for calling. That was really nice of you to call. And then he said, but the stuff that it's good is really good. So why don't you come in and see me tomorrow after you get off your work? Which we did. And then we spent the next two weeks every day coming to visit Dan Aykroyd at uh, Saturday Night Live. He gave us notes on all of our scripts. That's amazing. It was amazing. And we went away and we rewrote everything. And then he, we gave it to him. He put together a pack and he presented it to Lauren Michaels. He said, I really think the, these guys could do the show. Lauren Michaels said to him, we're barely breathing. Uh, we're not doing any more hiring this season. So Danny called and told us that. And we were so happy that he had done all of that for us. And he said, but, and here's the point of this long story. <laughs> uh, he said, um, let me call Sean Kelly over at the Lampoon. I think they could use you. And he called him up. And sure enough, we uh, set up an appointment, went over to Lampoon, and we were there for the next three years. I quit my straight job, and we were off and running. So that's, uh, that's the story. That's incredible. Yeah, it really is. And, and I've told it so many times. It's, it almost sounds rote to me, but every once in a while, I listen to what I'm saying and realize how lucky we were. So what was it like working with Ackroyd during those weeks, like getting notes? and? It was great. We actually became very good friends. I mean, he was so friendly to us, such a good guy, such a good human being, you know, just rocketing to, they were all rocketing to stardom. Uh, he took so much time to do that with us. Years later, when we were at Warner Brothers, he approached us. He said, I've got a pilot at CBS that I would like you guys to write. And we were doing our own thing at that point. But we, because it was Danny, we took the assignment and we wrote a pilot with Danny. And that was really fun. But the really cool thing, and now we, uh, we were hanging around, that he had a, an office very close to us. We used to go and play cards. We were, you know, very friendly with each other. The first time we saw him after that Saturday Night Live thing was in uh, 1982 at the Emmys. We were nominated for Emmy for SCTV. He was Catherine O'Hara's date and sitting directly behind me at the ceremony. Candy was on my left. Aykroyd was right behind me. And I turned around and Stu was down the row a bit. And I turned around. And I said, do you remember me? And he remembered everything that happened. And he said, I can't believe you're getting, you might get an Emmy tonight. And we did. You did get an Emmy. Yeah, we did. It's a pretty cool story how like, you know, certain people in your life can, can pop up at certain times. Mm -hmm. So the Emmy that of which you speak for SCTV. Yeah. You shared with Catherine O'Hara. Yeah, with the whole cast. Yeah. And I think there were six or seven additional writers. It's crazy when you think like that was Catherine O'Hara's only Emmy up until the point where she won the Emmy for acting in Schitt's Creek. She had never yeah. won an actual acting Emmy, only a writing Emmy that right. she shared with you. Yeah, well, I don't look at it as only a writing Emmy. Well, no, no, no. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, when, I mean, for Catherine O'Hara. No, I know. I yeah, know. yeah. I mean, she for uh, no, all, they, all I, that, none she of them never were won. Able... She never won one for act. She never won one for acting. That's all I meant. No, and no one, uh, none of that cast was ever nominated. Well, with, remember this though: the show uh, was only two NBC seasons, and then there was a big lag, and then they did uh, Cinemax, and the, so. Uh, the two NBC seasons, they were nominated total uh, for writing, I think a total of five or five times. Uh, and they won, I uh, won both years. I can't remember anybody being nominated as an actor from the show. And they should have been all nominated for that. Yeah, agreed. Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick break. I want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations, and that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my fabulous conversation with Chris Cluse, about to dive into the first time he worked with Catherine O'Hara. And we're back. But you worked with Catherine O'Hara even before SCTV. Yes. In something called From Cleveland. Oh, boy, you've done your research. Yes, uh, there's a, a very fine and uh, great 
TV producer director named Rocco Urbisi. Uh, on the very first TV show we worked, he was the the producer, the creative producer. We did a couple of projects with him right away after that, in the very earliest, our earliest days. So in 1980, 1979, the end of 79, he said, I'm, I just sold a concept at CBS. And the concept was that put together a, an act, you know, a, a troupe of writers and actors. And we would travel around the country and do a, 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 do a late night uh, show once a month from different cities. And I remember not saying anything, but just thinking to myself, this is the worst idea I have ever heard. And I didn't say it to him because I loved him. And he said, I'd like you guys to be part of this. And we said, of course, we would love to do that. So in um, the, right at the end of February in 1980, we went off to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where we, I didn't probably didn't need Ohio. Um, <laughs> it's like Paris, France. You don't you really don't need France in general. I mean, if it's Texas, that's one thing, but come on. Uh, so we went off uh, the SCTV cast without John Candy, and this was before Moranis. So it was um, everyone else, Dave and Eugene and Catherine and et cetera, et cetera, Joe Flaherty. So we went off and stayed in a place called Swingo's, and you got to hit the G. It's important. Swingo's Celebrity Hotel, and there were plenty of celebrities there at that time. It was uh, Blackstone the Magician was there. Uh, the Boomtown Rats were there. And uh, one night while leaving my room, I'd forgotten the guy's name. You sir, somebody or other who started Live Aid. But he was this, this uh, British uh, rock star. I walked past him and he was wet and nude in the hallway, cursing the Coke machine. And then I knew rock and roll was the life for me. Bob Geldof. Yes, Geldof, right. And no, he also said to me as I was going to the elevator, he said, no fucking hot weather in this fucking place. Okay, then. But there may be clothing, so you might want to try that. So we stayed in this hotel, and we everybody in show business happened to come through in the, in the month we were there. And we wrote every day, and then we'd go, go and shoot the stuff that we wrote, and we shot probably, I think we shot three hours of a show. And uh, when it came time to compile it, Rocco tried his best. He said, I can't link any of this. These sketches are so disparate, I can't link them. So somebody suggested maybe, oh, actually, it was his idea. He was going to get this guy, Kid Leo, who was the uh, the number one rock and roll disc jockey in Cleveland, which is saying a lot because Cleveland was a capital of rock and roll at one time. And uh, so he was going to get Kid, Kid Leo. And by the time we got back and he was uh, working, he was at, back in California and he was putting the show together, Kid Leo just kind of <laughs> he disappeared. So we were stuck without a narrative. And I suggested to him that we knew Bob and Ray because we had had a, quite an afternoon with them once. And he said, if you could get those guys, that would be amazing. And we got those guys. We got them to come out to Santa Monica and, and record uh, the stuff we needed them to record on video and audio. And uh, that show was well put together. And surprisingly, I mean, I'm shocked to this day that CBS didn't pick it up because it really was crazy. And you can see it, by the way, on a YouTube. You can look at from Cleveland. So that's where... We first met Catherine and the, the whole gang, yeah. And it was because of that connection, because we did that show, that when NBC picked up SCTV, they called us and, and wanted to, wanted us to come to Canada, and we did. Awesome. Yeah, I watched some of it on YouTube. There was a really funny sketch with Eugene Levy and Dave Thomas acting as homeless people in front yeah, of Yeah, we them. wrote that. Well, Stu and I wrote that. That was, the open, that was the great. The opening of the show, yeah. Really, really but, funny. Yeah, guys, I'm going to the boat show or whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> this watch <laughs> <laughs> okay so all right so that was before season three of sctv yeah. so then that season yeah. three happens and then nbc pulls it over for season four right right to replace uh the midnight special yes which rocco also had produced which i loved now if john candy's back right now yeah. it's 90 minutes it's now called yeah. sctv network Network 90, Network 90 had, had everything, everything that it was, it was in their title. <laughs> the, the whole kitchen sink. So, I mean, the, an insane cast. And then towards the end of this year is when uh, Martin Short joined. Well, he joined the, the next season. He wasn't, well, no, you know what? He did show up at the very end. You're right. The yeah, last few episodes. Yeah, you're right. Because he was in a sketch that we wrote right at the end. Yeah. 
Yeah, because he's listed with your Emmy too. Uh, oh no, no, he's not. That's Michael. Short. Oh, he's his it's brother, not. Michael. Michael Short, his brother, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is hilarious and uh, just a fine human being. Dave Thomas at the time is the head writer, showrunner. No, there was no showrunner. The uh, the show that show was run by Chaos, and I don't mean Maxwell Smart. Uh, <laughs> thanks for getting the reference. Yeah, but it really was a chaotic free for all without a producer. There was a, a producer named Alan Rucker who was a very fine guy. Uh, who was on the show, but he was doing, he was more or less doing um, uh, line producing. He wasn't really being a creative producer. And uh, there was another guy named Patrick Whitney or Whitley, and he was also a producer, but I don't know what the hell he did. And then there was, uh, that was it. Then there was the cat, well, they had Bert, uh, Solins, and they were never there. So and now Andrew Alexander. And so none of, there was no real producer input by anybody. And so Dave was kind of anointed head writer, but then that went away, and then Dick Lasucci and Paul Flaherty got it, then that left, and then it was back to Dave, and then it was Joe, and then, but it came down to they would write, everyone would write, they didn't write as a group, generally, they would, you know, go away and write, and then put it in a pack, just like any other sketch show, and read everything, those who were, you know, then any politic, they would politic for their pieces, because they were unofficially the producers of the show. And so there was a lot of chaos, but I think out of that chaos came amazing creativity. It was almost like, can you top this? It's funny, like on uh, IMDb, there's like 39 episodes of yeah. SCTV. I, I was surprised myself on the number. I would have expected it to be so much higher, but it was yeah, it, the well, years that it spanned, it wasn't necessarily on every year of that duration. No, it was on uh, the first two seasons. First season was... I think they made the entire run. I don't know how many episodes there were, but I think they made the whole thing for about $400. There was no money and there was no sponsorship and they were lucky to survive. The only thing they had going for them in a crazy way was their incredible creativity. Anybody who saw the show was enamored with it and was amazed by it because you know you knew there was no budget and you knew there was nothing really... Uh, but they would just create amazing characters and great situations and, and do them on the cheap. But that was what sort of made the show because the whole idea for those who, people who are not, or are not familiar with SCTV, the idea was simple that it was a small television station uh, somewhere in the world in North America. Uh, it had no budget and it was just a place uh, like a little TV a station that could. And that was the idea. And that's what kind of gave license to all of the amazing creative things that they did because it was, you know, the basis was this place run by a guy in a wheelchair who didn't really need the wheelchair. So that's pretty much all you need to know about that. <laughs> Joe Flattery. Exactly. The low budge was the... Low budge made it. Yeah. And then later when NBC started pouring money into it, it was like they would look at each other and go, I don't know, we could do that. You know, they could do the Watergate show and The Godfather, and that would never been able to been done as well as it was done before. So there was a real blessing to the increased budget. But maybe a little bit of the charm was missing. But it didn't matter. It was still great. It was fantastic. Do you have a favorite sketch, something that you created? Yeah, uh, I got a couple. One, is, uh, well, there's so many while we were there. None of ours are made my top list, but they did Polynesia Town, which absolutely kills me. Because uh, on that show, they couldn't just introduce music acts. They felt that they had to work them in organically. So, for instance, John, uh, what's his name? Doc, Dr. John appeared in, in that sketch. And it was all revolved around a parody of Chinatown, where Catherine plays... Faye Dunaway. And Johnny LaRue is uh, John Candy, is Jack Nicholson's character. And the schnook is played by Joe uh, Flaherty, who plays a character named Vic Hedges that is one of the funniest characters I've ever seen in my life. But the sketch was known to people who love the show and uh, real aficionados as the, the uh, boom the boom shot of uh, the the crane shot that's what it was that there was a crane shot they spent so much money on the crane that it became legendary uh, they someone made up t-shirts that said i had nothing to do with polynesia town we would wear them around the office <laughs> 
would you that you would rank that as one of your career highlights? Probably creatively, uh, number one. But I think that goes for everybody who was associated with it. Um, you know, we only did one season of. I believe, 12 episodes. It's sort of a magical show in the sense that when you think about like, yes. just every one of those, uh, Eugene Levy, Andrea Martin, Rick Moranis, yeah. Catherine O'Hara, Dave, T I, they, they, John Candy, they all just kind of just blew up. Well, Rick, uh, so this is 1981, 1981, and I think Rick invented MTV, you know, with his DJ, with his uh, video DJ character, and then would do his own um, music videos that were just the best. He's a brilliant guy. Rick Moranis, yeah. I mean, he's, he's a brilliant he's... guy. We did a sketch, kind of helped him write it, but more importantly, we're in it. A sketch called The Larry Siegel Show. He had had a meeting in LA with um, a movie producer named Joel Silver. He was so taken with this, the char this character that he met that he came back and he was working on an impression on him. Uh, he said, I don't know, I'm not sure what we can do with him. So someone suggested, I think it might have been my partner, that put him in a talk show as the host of the talk show. Because once we saw how funny the character was, and so opposite of what a, what a talk show host would be. And so it became the Larry Siegel show. And we appeared as the comedy team of Dennis and David. The whole idea behind Joel Siegel is no, uh, Joel Silver, Joel Siegel, is that uh, nobody gets a word in. And that was just, we sat on that stage and we had to stop tape about 18 times because we would just laugh in the wrong places. And it was just <laughs> inappropriately hilarious. And it was great. So that was another of my favorites. I love that one. I loved, well, the, you know, we weren't there for The Godfather, but that certainly is one. And there's so many, so many. So much greatness. So much. How much greatness can a person take? I Googled a uh, Larry Siegel show thing. I watched it yesterday. It was just so easy. Like, what are you going to do? Watch reruns of the Fonzie? <laughs> <It's just so laughs> <fun. laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The same five minutes? <laughs> that was uh, screaming at us. We didn't know he was going to do that. And that's what was so funny about it. He just let go. And he was so full of anger, you know, so full of anxiety. And that's who uh, later on we got a call. My agent got a call. Uh, Joel Silver would like to meet you guys. So we thought, oh, maybe this is write one of his crappy movies. <laughs> so uh, we went over to Paramount again, and we met with Joel Silver, who sat in exactly the same way in the seat that Larry Siegel did. And he said, so uh, how was it to, pull, to be in a sketch with the guy playing me? Well, it's like, oh, you know, what a question. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> How do you, you don't have a ready answer for that. Other than, it was great. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. I loved it. I couldn't believe he was doing me. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, we're nodding because we want that movie, you know. So uh, he's talking. We're nodding. We're agreeing with everything he says. And then he says, all right, get the fuck out of here. And that was it. So all he wanted to do was talk about himself. Yeah, what are you going to do? That's funny. Let's move on to some other cool stuff that you've done, uh, other highlights. So you have two shows that you created. Malloy, right, with my aunt? With my I am Alec, and we discovered a 19-year-old Jennifer Aniston. Little Jennifer Aniston. I have a funny story about that. Yeah. Well, here's the story. So our casting person uh, brings us this nice cast. I mean, we had some really nice people in there. Pamela Brule was in it, and, well, Mayim, and, and she was 10 years old, and she was uh, very funny, a very good little actress. She just come off a movie called Beaches, with, uh, where she played a very young Bette Midler. So she was she was a little bit hot. She had an she had a deal with Fox that was laid off at Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers did an, a pilot of sorts and that just failed and was pretty awful. And then they still had the commitment for six episodes. So they said, "Would you you guys do this?" And we said, "Well, we haven't ever run a show before." And he said, "Well, could you j redevelop it then?" So we did. We redeveloped. It changed everything, and just the only thing the same was the title. And uh, then they asked us to run it. We figured, what the hell? So we go to casting at Fox because it was on. It was one of like four shows on Fox. They had uh, some kind of uh, cop show, and then there was uh, something else. And it was Married with Children, and there was uh, this. Uh, and they were, I think, they were only on three nights a week. I mean, it was really minor league baseball in those days. So it was a good training ground for us. So we go to see Peter Chernin, who was then running the TV division at Fox, 
uh, who I'm sorry, who was running the network at Fox. So we go to see him with this cast and we have read and fallen in love with this 19-year-old kid who just come out from New York. His name was uh, Jennifer Aniston. Well, we bring uh, everybody in to read. Now, what we did with her was we made sure we had somebody who uh, there'd be no way that this guy would choose her over Jennifer. I impossible. If we could have gotten away with um, bringing in someone with uh, some awful condition, we would have, you know, but just to assure that she got the gig. So we walk in with this uh, cast, we're casting and casting, and he's, he's sort of paying attention and, oh, yeah, it's fine, and moving along. And then it was time for the sister, who was played by Jennifer. So we, of course, bring in the other person first, who stinks it up. We're looking at each other smiling, you know, and this, the casting director is smiling right, without him seeing us. And then she leaves, and uh, he says, yeah, you know, kind of like her. Oh, no, you're not, no, you're not supposed to like her. <laughs> with the like her. And in comes Jennifer, and she is funny. I mean, she's really funny. I don't have to tell you. And she comes in at 19, she hits a ball out of the park. And then yeah, he, he nods and she leaves. And he said, I like the first one better. And I thought, oh my God, this is impossible. How could you be this blind? So we said, well, you know, let us bring in somebody else because we don't want, you know, we don't want her. So we leave, and Jennifer is waiting in the hallway. And kind of looked at her and just shook my head, no. And she bursts into tears and she runs out. And we're looking at each other and our secretary is in the hall. And she says, if he didn't pay any attention, why don't you bring her back tomorrow? So, well, not a bad idea, except she's going to look exactly like she looks. And she said, no, she's not, because I'm going to take her to what we used to call, and she did call, the beauty parlor and we're going to henna her hair. And I said, whatever that is, that sounds good. So we got another locks to bring in, and we brought in a hennaed Jennifer, who comes in and does exactly the same as she did the day before. And he says, while she's even in the room, you're great, you got it, you got the part. Exactly the same thing. That's incredible. Yeah, and so that was her first job in television, and she was great. She is one of the most naturally hilarious sitcom actresses like she's just she's got a knack for that she does her timing is so she's so funny and it was that good when she was 19 i'm a big fan of her the leprechaun movie oh yeah by the way did we have busted her ball so many times over that <laughs> i went through a old leprechaun movie phase right i was just obsessed Would with you? those movies <laughs> a phase yeah i love that i love those movies the other TV show that you created uh, was Stu, Madman of the People, right. with Dabney Coleman, part yeah. of the uh, must-see TV. That's the main story in my book when I write it. Uh, that was the, the hardest year of my life. The whole, from uh, conception, conception was easy. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but conception was easy. The casting was so hard. NBC would not, we... We wrote it with Judd Hirsch in mind because it was supposed to be kind of a, a New York liberal guy who wrote for this magazine like Pete Hamill or Jimmy Breslin or one of those guys, you know. So we thought Judd Hirsch would be the Jewish version of, of Breslin, but real New York. And, and the guy was angry and somewhat angry anyway, the world, but he had his lovely home uh, life. And uh, the concept was that uh, his daughter becomes a publisher in the magazine, so he has to work for her, okay? It's not the most original, wasn't a great premise, but the late Jamie um, Tarsus saw her own story in it when she was the buyer at NBC. Because <laughs> we had pitched it at CBS and we got a pass and then we pitched it at NBC and we got an immediate buy. They bought it in the room. They, she loved it. And it became very clear, her father was Jay Tarsus, who was one of the legendary situation comedy writers, and she had a kind of an interesting relationship with him where he, he had worked for her when she was an executive. So she bought the concept and right away and was very, very high on it, but also had to get, we had to get the casting right. And it was a real struggle to get that done. Uh, we ended up with Dabney Coleman, who, got to be honest with you, nobody really thought was right. But he got it made, and we, you know, we got it on, and, this, and the pilot was tested. The only pilot that tested higher than that on NBC in the preceding 10 years was The Cosby Show. 
and the pilot went through the roof and we got picked up for the for a season and it was the worst year of my life it was a horrible struggle it was really awful so thanks for bringing it up oh i'm sorry to bring <laughs> it, it does have the distinction of being one of the highest rated shows though ever to get, get canceled ever to get canceled yeah yeah well what? the thing was that it premiered the same night as two shows you may have heard of and er which of those three shows do you not remember yeah that's right okay well they were they ended up replacing your time slot with friends so th this was my tie back which was you created the juggernaut of jennifer aniston <laughs> yeah it was all my fault <laughs> all right let's talk tonight court let's let's go to happier times <laughs> okay well listen that was there was a lot of happy times you had wonderful writers on the show and it was it was a really fun show to do except except if you had to deal with a, a certain person on the show but it was you know it was okay it was it was good but it really it put me in the hospital i woke up one morning in the middle of the season and i had what is called hummingbird heart it was 178 beats a minute. Wow. Yeah. So I, I rushed myself off to, I was rushed off by my wife to the hospital. The cardiologist who had to treat me because he had to get my heart rate down, he said, this is, you have no heart disease. You have nothing wrong with your heart. This is pure anxiety. And he said, what do you think is causing it? And I said, well, it could be my job. He said, uh, then you need to quit your job. Well, we didn't uh, until it was too late. Anyway, moving on. Well, I'm glad you're okay from that. Oh, I'm fine. Another classic night court. You were there in the beginning and then at the end as showrunner. Beginning at the end, yeah. Uh, four seasons out of the nine, the first two and the last two. We'd written a, a movie for Columbia in 1982. When we came back from SCTV, we pitched a, a baseball movie at Columbia called MVP. We sold it, and they they wanted us to write it specifically for Bill Murray, who was who had left SNL, and they wanted to make into a movie star, which happened without their benefit. I mean, I don't think they they were necessary. So we wrote this because also he we knew that he had named his son Homer Banks Murray, and Banks was from Ernie Banks, the Chicago shortstop, and Homer, of course, was what you do in a baseball game. So. We wrote it for him and specifically, and we turned it in Columbia, and they uh, they called us up and said, yeah, we, this is great. We love this, and uh, we're going to go to Bill with it, and they did, and Bill, to my knowledge, and this is now 42 years later, uh, has still not read it. So boy, when he does, he'll be the 70-year-old rookie on the baseball team. Funny story uh, affiliated with that. Worked on a TV show with a guy named Michael Leeson, a very uh, good comedy writer, on a show that he created. We were kind of consulting on the show, and I told him that story. And he said, I got a better one than that, because you always have to top everyone's stories. So his, his is this. He wrote a spec script called The Survivors, and uh, he sold it at Paramount. And it was they wanted uh, Bill Murray to do it. Bill Murray wouldn't read it, and Robin Williams got the part, and Walter Matthau, and it was a bomb. And many years later, when Blockbuster was still around, there it was yellowing a VHS copy of it sitting in the 99-cent bin when Michael Leeson gets a phone call from Bill Murray saying, I'll do it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of amazing stories. Oh, man. So Night Court, same thing with Cheers, though. Like, well, let me tell you why I said that, because the, this, the MVP script got to Reinhold Wiggy. Now, we had never done a sitcom, and uh, so he had read it. Someone gave it to him, and he read it, and he loved it, and he called us up. He said, can you come here? And then we went there, and then he said, I'd like to make you guys staff writers. And we said, that sounds like something we could do, and that's what happened. Did you enjoy the time at Night Court? Two of us and a guy named a lovely guy and a great talent named uh, Tom Reeder. So it was the three of us that, with Reiny that did the whole the first 13 episodes. And it was so much fun to do. Night Cards, again, another one of those classics. And then I rewatched Quadrangle. Quadrangle of Love. I, it's such a great, I love Harry Anderson. I was always a huge Harry Anderson yeah. fan and yeah. all of them. And um, this uh, had Thelma Diamond in it, who was amazing. Right. His whole Mel Torme thread, loving Mel Torme. Right. Right. And not being able to get tickets to the concert. And then the scalper comes in and has 30 yeah. tickets, but he can't, <laughs> he can't take the tickets because they're evidence. I think we wrote that sketch, uh, that, that 
episode. Yeah, I yeah, think. that was one of yours. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so it was, <laughs> it was just great. Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick break, and we're back with more Night Court. Talk to me about the end, though, because yeah. what I read was like at the end, they're like, we're done, wrap it up. Oh, no, we're going to do another season. And then it kind of screwed everything up. Well, as I said, you know, we were on this deal or development deal now at Warner Brothers, and we had two pilots. This was in 1989 into 90. They were doing their seventh season. And Stu and I, and at the end of season two, looked at each other and said, this is going nowhere. Let's get the hell out of here. And uh, that was wise. Uh, we left and did, uh, you know, ended up doing all those other things and do hard and cheers and was other shows. But probably if we had stayed there, we would have uh, been fine. But we thought it was not going <laughs> anywhere. And then five years later, Warner Brothers asked us to take it over after the previous showrunners who had replaced uh, the original Reinhold Wiggy uh, were uh, kind of shown the door by the cast. Cast had taken over the Madhouse. What happened was I ran into John LaRiquette in the men's room outside of stu uh, stage nine and eight. When we were doing Malloy on stage eight, they were doing a night court in stage nine. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're doing the show next door. And the next thing I know, my agent gets a call from our agent. They gets a call, Bob Broder from Harvey and president of Warner Brothers. He says, uh, not Weinstein, by the way, Weinstein. He says, uh... Warner Brothers would like you to run the last season, season eight. And we said, no, we're not interested because we have these pilots. And he said, no, no, you didn't hear me. You're interested. And so he renegotiated our contract that day with Warner Brothers, adding two years to the deal and, and paying off the old, the old deal in one day with a, just a single check. So we were in. We went in to close it down in season eight, uh, but we had a funny thing happen. Um, they put it back on Wednesday nights, and the ratings started going up. And the show was was really had already kind of felt like it was washed away, you know. But it wasn't. There was enough strength there that the audience grew, and because of that, they picked it up for a ninth season. So we were surprised. We had hoped that they would pick it up for a tenth season, and they told us they were thinking strong. NBC was thinking strongly about it. So we didn't uh, write a, a proper ending to the to the show, uh, which, by the way, became the subject of an episode of Thirty Rock. Yeah, I was going to ask you what you thought of that episode. Believe me, sit, uh, sitting through that was painful because they were right. Anyway, but I got to tell you something. The as opposed to those a couple of other bad experiences, that was the best experience on a job of any kind in my life. We had a wonderful crew who was so happy to have producers who, who respected them. You know, one of the first things we did was have lunch with all the, all the department heads who never, ever spoke ever to the previous guys. We tried our best to charm everybody. We took every cast member out to lunch, and we couldn't get Marcia Warfield. She was not interested. I'm not sure why she wasn't. She didn't seem to like us very much. By about week three of season eight, she had two sweatshirts made up for us. And the sweatshirt said on them, Marsha made a mistake about you. That makes her like really, really cool. She is so cool. She was just excited to have beat the bailiff curse. <laughs> right. I think what really turned it on is that I said to her one day, I insist that you have a chest x-ray. Right. <laughs> why? I said, I said F figure it out. So I won't go into it, but figure it out. And she did. And then she kind of thought, oh, okay, these guys are cool. That's awesome. So you mentioned leaving and thinking that was, and then realizing that was a bad idea. So another yeah. person that did that, I believe a friend of yours, Al Jean, right? He did that to Simpsons. He left, did the critic did, and then came yeah. back and has run it for decades. Yeah. I've had Al Jean on my podcast. We actually grew up in the same town in Michigan. Oh yeah. Nice. Big Detroit fan for sports. His family had Jean's hardware, which we mm -hmm. went to all the time. Right. And he looks like a guy who would work in a hardware store. Al is uh, uh, just a lovely guy. Lovely guy. So you wrote uh, Donnie Fatso, season 22. So this is like, at this point, there's a thousand episodes of The Simpsons. This was uh, 2010? 2010, guess. right. Well, we, I wrote it uh, the year before. What happened was another story, oddly enough. What happened was well, my partnership had broken up in uh, the year 1999. And uh, so... 
I had a hard time finding a gig because I had been part of a team for 25 years. And because when you're a part of a team, nobody knows who does what. So I had to, to kind of prove myself all over again. Ended up on a show on Showtime called Beggars and Choosers, which was a great experience. It was a single camera show that was very funny and also kind of weird. And that led to Mad TV. Uh, and Mad TV led me back to seeing Mike Reese, who was, uh, has been a writer on, sh- on Simpsons forever and was Al's uh, partner. Mike's been on the podcast as well. Good guy. So funny. And that got me back to seeing Al. And then we're kind of hanging out with Al a couple of times. And then came the uh, 2008 writer's strike. And I was assigned uh, picket duty on uh, at 20th Century Fox on Pico Boulevard. And so was Al. So I would see Al every day and we would talk for half hour, an hour or whatever it was that we would walk around together and then get bored with each other and then move on to somebody else. But we did it almost every day. And so when the strike was over after six months or whatever it was, I get a call one day from Al. And I'm thinking, oh, lunch. I don't think Al does lunch, but okay. He says, I, you know, I said, we had such a good time and you're so funny. Why don't you come and write an episode of The Simpsons? And I said, uh, Al, I got to be honest with you. I'm the wrong guy. And he said, why? Why are you the wrong guy? And I said, well, how many episodes have you done? He said, uh, 400 and at that point, like 430. And he said, yeah, yeah. Ask me how many, I said this to him, ask me how many I've seen. And it begins with four. So he said, 40? He said, take another shot. He said, four? And I said, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe six, maybe 10, maybe three. I'm not <laughs> maybe sure. Maybe <six. laughs> I'm not sure. I said, but I got to tell you, I, I I know it's a classic. I know you guys do amazing work. You turn out an amazing show every week, but it never grabbed me. I got to be honest with you. I, I, the, the whole cartoon thing. And he said, what is it? It's a cartoon thing. It's not, it's not a cartoon. It's The Simpsons. It's like the greatest sitcom that's ever. I said, I'll, I, I'll give you that. I'll get, I, love, I love the idea of it. And I just great. I said, but I, haven't, I am the least qualified guy to do this job. And, I, and so he was like stunned. He said, Ricky Gervais is doing, we do have two guests a year. Ricky Gervais is one, I'm asking you to be the other. And I said, well, that was good. Good you got Gervais, he's funny. I don't know the show, so. So now I get a call from my agent who says, I just talked to uh, Al Jean. What do you think you're doing? He said, well, I don't know. I just tell him, be, I love the guy, he's a great guy. I just don't feel qualified to do the show. He says, you're qualified call him up. So I called him back and I said, okay, I'll do it. Bob Burr says I have to do it. And he says, oh, gee, thanks. You know? So I said, so what do I have to do? He said, well, come in uh, with five ideas. He said, we will have done them all. It's the way it always happens. We'll have done them all. And then we'll find something. We'll assign it to you. You'll write it. Okay. That's good. He said, come in uh, like next Monday. He said, all right. So that weekend, I went with my wife to a conference in Palm Springs, an educational conference. She's an educator. So I go to the thing and I bring the dog and I go to the Blockbuster, which is the second time I've said it now. I go to the Blockbuster in Palm Springs and I say, you have any episodes of The Simpsons? And the guy points to a wall of them. And I asked him if he could pick one out that was particularly good. And it was like I asked the busboy to pick out the wine because he couldn't give two shits less about what I thought was good. So he just walked over and sort of grabbed one and said, here, take this one. It's great. <laughs> he didn't even look at it. I said, okay, I get it. I'm a jerk. So I take the thing and we go back. I go back to the room. The dog's waiting for me and I pop it in my computer. And I'm not kidding you. I'm asleep in five minutes, dead asleep to the point where my <laughs> wife comes back from the conference and I'm drooling on the hotel bed. And my uh, computer has apparently shown me the entire DVD. So I tell her what happens and she says, you know, God, um, I said, why don't you, she said, oh, I said, I can't, I can't, I can't watch it. So she says, well, uh, why don't you just go ahead and uh, do some Googling on it? So I Googled it and it ended up at the Fox website where they had a list of characters. And I wrote down all the characters I knew 
And I realized I had known more than I thought. So I'd seen probably more than four. So I came up with a, a story that I thought was going to be great. Then there was another one, and then there was another one, and then there was a, one that was okay, and then it was Johnny Fats, uh, Donnie Fatso, which was last, and to me, my least favorite. But we went on Monday, and I pitched the idea, and these, these guys, it was their most disinterested group of people I have ever been near. I mean, they were not impolite, but they were whatever's next door to impolite is what they were. And... They like I would say something and they would not think it was funny or they didn't they didn't care you know they just they they pumped this stuff out beautifully and artistically magically but not interested in the outside world so I come in I pitch a first idea and they look at each other and snicker and they're like uh, Al says I I think we've done a version of that probably eighteen times I said oh geez this is bad that was my favorite. So I pitched another one, and they kind of were interested in it, and they had dumb version of it. And then I pitched one that they looked at each other and realized they had never heard it before. I was so happy. I felt like I had really done a big achievement. They were going to buy that. I really liked the idea. And then they said, what else you got? So I said, oh, no. So I pitched the fourth thing, and then Donnie Fatso, which was... Just what it sounds like. I said, the, the, the only pitch I got out of my mouth was uh, Homer kills fat Tony. And they said, that's, that's it. That's the one we want. So, okay. And then they bought the third one. I don't know if they bought it just to get it off the street or they were planning on using it down the road. It never happened, but they bought it from me. So that was good. And then I went away and uh, came up with a, an outline, as they always ask you to do, and come back with the outline. They gave me voluminous notes on the outline. And then I went back to my house, and uh, I wrote the script in about four days because the outline was, was so detailed. And I delivered the script, and that was it. Once you've done the outline with notes and you've done the script, as an outsider, you're done. So I got paid, and a year went by. Oh, it was a, it was a January 1st episode. And it was too late to produce it. So they moved it a year. So I almost forget about it. I mean, I know it's, I know I sold it. I know they bought it. And ne next thing I know, they're making it. They're doing the voices. John Hamm was in it. And Lo Mantagna, he's, a, he's Fat Tony, you know. They make it. And on January 1st, it, or whatever it is, close to January 1st, it airs and does very well. And I'm thinking, oh, that was a, that really was great. I'm so glad I did it. And then four months later, a year, maybe another year later, whatever it was, get a call from Al. And Al says, guess what? Uh, and I'm thinking, you want me to do another episode? That was not the case. He said, you've been nominated for a Writers Guild Award. Now, I have been nominated four times before for Writers Guild Award and never once. And I told him, I said, I'm, Sus I'm the Susan Lucci of the Writers Guild. I keep losing. He said, that's okay. It's fine. We lose all the time. We win and we lose. And so I'm going to come to the thing and I sit at the, si the Simpsons table. I got my wife and one of my daughters and we're sitting at the Simpsons table. I just realized how ironic it is that where I am and the way it started. So I brag, uh, braggadociously tell everybody that I'm going to win and um, you're not. And they think it's hilarious. And all of a sudden I'm getting laughs. So up comes the award. And of course I lose. But I slammed my fist down on the table and I said, you cheated me, you bastards. I was their best friend for the rest of the night. It was just, we had so much fun. And there, that's the story. Interestingly enough, that episode is considered non-canon. Yeah, I know, which is fine. Well, I was non-canon. <laughs> it means they can pretend the, it, that the events did not happen if they need Man. to contradict it at some point. It was great. Yeah. It was uh, Homer goes undercover to get Fat Tony. Yeah, he wants to because of, he breaks some laws on the 1st of January when the laws changed. He didn't know it. And he gets thrown in jail. And so the John Hamm comes to him, the guy named FBI character comes to him and says, I'll make a deal with you. You got to help us get Fat Tony. Which, by the way, when I was watching that, there's a new show called Blackbird on Apple TV, the exact uh -huh. same plot. <laughs> but it's a, based on a true story. You, I mean, you did it 12 years earlier. But, uh, <laughs> but it happens to be really good. If you watch it, you'll be like, oh, this is like a, a live action uh, Donnie Fat. Uh, is, are Homer and Fat Tony actually in it? Because then I would say they ripped us off. No, no, different, different characters. Oh, okay. But, uh, it, I don't think it said story inspired by. I, I've kept you so long. I thank you so much for all these amazing stories you've it's got. fun it's you know what no, no one likes to hear me more than i do <laughs> i'm gonna i gotta be honest with you you know well you've had uh, an amazing career you got some exciting stuff coming up 
I have a movie that I wrote, oh God, in 2009 that has been uh, on the precipice of uh, being produced over the many years of involvement from everyone from um, Will Ferrell and... Uh, Josh Gad. Well, Josh Gad, yeah, and, so, and some other producers and directors and John Carney and then we were ready to go and then in 17 along comes Harvey Weinstein who takes a big crap on show business. The movie was just about to go into pre-production. Director walked away and Will Farrell, who was going to play the lead, walked away because it was considered uh, risque, if you wish. It's the story of Russ Meyer, who invented the American nudie film, and the year 1969-70, where he made a movie called Beyond the Valley of the Dolls with his young screenwriter, Roger Ebert. It's such a great story, and I must say it's a, it's a really good script. It was shit-canned in 2017 because of that, and I thought, well, we'll never see the likes of that again. And during the pandemic, I talked to the, one of the producers who had stayed with the project since 2010 and said, uh, I want to take some time because I'm, the pandemic is driving me insane. I want to be able to concentrate on something. I think I want to solve the problem of this script. And I did. The problem was solved by the addition of the female character of Russ's wife, who I had, who had just divorced prior to this story. And I brought her back in and made it kind of a feminist tone and this kind of weird thing that had happened to the script. I sent it back to the guy and he sent it to STX Studios who had been interested in making the film in the first place in 2017. And they said, let's do it. And they've just gotten into business with Lionsgate on it. So those two entities will produce it. Josh Gad is still attached. So keep your fingers crossed for me. I'm going to, because the, the article I found on this movie was from 2015. Project has been out a long time. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be patient, you know. Well, Chris, thank you so much for spending all this time with me. Thanks, Jeff. It was really fun. And it's nice to talk because I don't know if you know, but I've been doing a bunch of these. And uh, it's nice to talk to somebody who has done a little homework so you don't have to explain everything. You just tell those savory stories, you know. That's what I shoot for. I appreciate you noticing. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you achieve it, <laughs> thank man. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everyone, that was Chris Cluse. Such an amazing body of work. So many fun stories. Had a great time talking with Chris earlier this year. Can't believe the interview's over. That means another episode has come and gone. Where does the time go? One more huge thank you to my special guest, Chris Cluse. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations. Classic Conversations.